Hi, and welcome to another Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a book review of Carol Pateman's Participation in Democratic Theory, all about um, how this applies. Participation is important for cooperatives and decision making process, and um, how we can see that working for us and other cooperatives. Watson has a mind map. We're going to jump into that. And the book is uh, pretty dense, the chapters. There's just uh, not too many chapters, but pretty dense. So Watson. Thanks. Um, and can you see the screen or no? Looks good. OK. All right. All right, so the first chapter, hold on one second. Let's see, Do I still have an echo? No? Can nope. you guys hear me? Okay. No echo, you're good. Let's All jump right. into that first chapter. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. So recent, so recent theories, theories of, of uh, uh, I'm still here. At me. All right. Is that me? Is that me? Uh, there is an echo. Let me. Let me. Can I mute the other? Maybe this one. All right. How's that? Oh, that sounds good. Okay. We good now? Yep. You can hear me? Okay. Let's turn myself up a bit. So turn myself. Here we go. So uh, recent theories of uh, democracy and the classical myth. So the, <clears throat> first off, an overview of um, the first two chapters and really the book, but let's just do the first two chapters. Um, it sets out the idea of what democratic theory is. This is a political science a book. Uh, there are what's called the classical theorists, um, and we'll get into them. And then there are going to be the more modern uh, theorists. And they take a strong position on what participation and the role of participation is um, in practice and in theory. Uh, this is important for any democratic institution, you know, whether it be a whole country or something like a, a company. <clears throat> so uh, there's some uh, paradoxical ideas of what, uh, what, how democracy works, so it makes it interesting. So uh, first, so in this first chapter, we're going to have the, the author goes through four different um, uh, political theorists that are influential for uh, democratic theory and then um, for contemporary democratic theory and then um, levels the critiques of the idea of the ideas that they have. So um, the one of the things that just jumps out at the beginning is that the uh, concept of participation only has a minimal role in the contemporary theory. Uh, so a prominent feature of recent theories of democracy uh, is the emphasis is placed on the dangers inherent in wide popular participation in politics. Um, and just taking a step back from this, it's kind of interesting to me that there are political theorists uh, at influential and probably the most influential political theorists on contemporary democracy that actively say participation is dangerous in uh, uh, democracy. So that, that should, you know, it's alarming to me. Um, it's very counterintuitive. And so they're going to explain why. 
uh, it's, it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory to me, um, but we're, we're going to get into it. So we have two theories here, Mosca and uh, I want to say Michelle's or Michael's. Uh, <clears throat> the former argued that in every society, uh, an elite must rule. And um, they made an argument for representative institutions. Uh, Michael's uh, with his famous iron law of oligarchy formulated on the basis of, in of investigation of German social democratic parties that were ostensibly dedicated to the principles of democracy inside their own ranks uh, kind of makes it to where we were faced with a choice. Um, and then that's talking about World War II and the rise of you know, Third Reich and everything. We're faced with a choice, either organization, which you could say is totalitarianism, which is in the 20th century uh, seemed indispensable, or and uh, democracy, but not both. So <clears throat> they talk a bunch about this. I kind of skipped over some of it, but um, there's, if you know anything of the history of what, um, the rise of Nazi Germany, there was the Weimar Republic, there was a democratic component to that. And they actually um, reinforced or highly prioritized participation. Um, so here it says like totalitarian regimes based on mass participation, albeit participation backed by intimidation and coercion. Uh, that's some of the, what was indicative in uh, like the Weimar Republic and, and some of the other like other forms of totalitarianism the, uh, as a critique of participation, the tendency for participation to become linked to the concept of totalitarianism, it's kind of opposite. Uh, it kind of shows up as like the opposite of that of a democracy. So um, <clears throat> one of the things with an interesting thing with the political science view of, of uh, democracy instead of kind of I mean, what you may want to call maybe an armchair quarterback view of is that they actually do empirical investigations. Like what do people actually do in the wild? So large scale empirical investigations into political attitudes and behavior in most uh, Western countries of the past 20, 30 years have revealed the outstanding characteristic of most citizens, more especially those in lower socioeconomic uh, status groups have a general lack of interest in politics and political activity. And further, widespread non-democratic or author authoritarian attitudes exist, again, particularly among lower socioeconomic status groups. So you can kind of see the argument being leveled with the contemporary theorists that if you have um, more participation of this group that actually favors authoritarianism, then you might get an authoritarian uh, political structure instead of democracy. So now we're going to get into Schumpeter. I want to say we might have done a review on one of his books. Or not, I know I've, I've read a bunch, but I don't know if I recommend it. But one of them, Schumpeter is the creative destruction guy. Who's mo mostly, just from my experience, people mostly know of him from that idea. Um, kind of the. Um, I want to say he had really was the one who originally came up with the idea of the innovator's dilemma, which was kind of reformulated by I think Christian Platonson. And I think we did in a review of innovator's dilemma book a long time ago. Um, but Joseph uh, Schumpeter is influential in democratic theory. Um, he attacks the notion of like the classical theorists. And he's saying that democratic theory is actually unassociated with any particular ideals or ends. So what does that mean? 
he gets into it uh, a little further and, and, and essentially he's saying it's 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 really um, it's it's really a means it's really uh, let's see here yeah Schumpeter's main criticism of classical doctrine was that the central participatory decision making role of the people rested on empirically unrealistic foundations in his revised theory it is the competition of potential decision makers for the people's vote that is the vital feature so he's, he's going to have some more critiques here he has he levels a bunch of critiques about and then kind of tries to take the idealistic part out of democracy and then the other cr critics try to come back in and say I, you know we, we probably went too fast there. So Schumpeter offered the following as a modern realistic definition of the democratic method, that institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. And so he kind of just reduces it to that. It might in that is that it really it might not be really a prescriptive it's more descriptive so there's nothing like right or wrong about this kind of thing it's just a it's a means to an end and he's saying that uh competition is the for leadership is the distinctive feature of democracy Schumpeter compared the political competition for votes to the operation of the economic market. Again, Schumpeter is kind of more known, well, as far as my experience, he's more known in the economic side. Um, so some, a lot of arguments come from that. So voters are like consumers um, that choose between uh, policies or products offered by competing political entrepreneurs and the parties regulate the competition like trade associations in the economic sphere. Uh, central. So for this book, Schumpeter's theory of democracy participation has no special or central role. And he has a, you know, kind of a scathing critique of participation. He says the electoral mass, says Schumpeter, is, a, is incapable of action other than a stampede. So I would say that Joseph Schumpeter being one of the most influential people within, as far as people quoting for democratic theory and critiquing democratic theory and being more contemporary and how we view democratic theory, even the definition of it, you have him critiquing the electoral mass. Right, okay. So, um, so we're gonna get into four different uh, influential uh, democratic theorists that are going to be more contemporary. Um, one of them is Burleson. So he says, so <clears throat> we're going to use this to develop a contem contemporary theory. So we have Burleson. Classical theory argues concentrated on the individual citizen. Again, they're going to be critiquing class classical theory. And then we're going to go into classical theory later. So classical theory, he argues, con concentrated on the individual citizen, ignoring the political system itself. So this is a critique saying they weren't very empirical on how the real world works, right? So you could say de facto democracy. Burleson lists conditions that are necessary if uh, political democracy is, is to survive. Intensity of conflict must be limited, rate of change must be restrained, social and economic stability maintained, and a pluralist social organization and basic consensus must exist. The idea of stability is one that permeates the different democratic theorists, contemporary democratic theorists. Again, going back to, we don't want to devolve into totalitarianism because the masses based off of empirical surveys and such actually favor 
some kind of authoritarianism, totalitarianism. This, this is the theorist. Dahl, the next theorist, seems very uncertain about whether there is or not such a thing as classical theory of democracy. He's basically saying that there's a whole bunch of ideas um, about what democracy is. Dahl regards the, theory, uh, regards the theories that he criticized in the preface to democratic theory as Madisonian and populist as inadequate for the present day and his theory of democracy as polyarchy, the rule of multiple minorities is presented as a more adequate replacement for these as an explanatory modern daring theory, a modern theory of democracy. So Madisonian and populist, so kind of you can have, they don't get in, in the initial um, chapter of this book too much into it, but you have the concepts of they have Jeffersonian democracy, you may have heard that phrase, you have Madisonian, and there's different levels of participation and kind of checks and balances against that. Here we go. Um, so under Dahl, the democratic relationship is only one of a number of social control techniques that in fact coexist in modern democratic polities. And this diversity must be taken uh, uh, must be taken into account in, in the modern theory of democracy, right? So you start talking about social control techniques. Again, kind of sounds almost like conspiracy theories. Like you wouldn't think a democratic uh, political scientist and writing in peer reviewed journals and going back and forth with each other are talking about, no, we're talking about control of the minority over the majority. You know, they, but they do. And then debating on the value of actually having people participating and saying that it's dangerous. So we're, and there's people that explicitly say it's dangerous, so we'll get some more into it. Uh, nor is it any use putting forward a theory that requires maximum participation from ordinary people for control to take place when we know that most tend to be disinterested and apathetic about politics. Again, this is Dahl, right? A relatively small proportion of individuals in any form of social organization will take up decision-making opportunities, okay? Uh, it is therefore on the other side of the electoral process on the competition between leaders for the votes of the people that control depends. So we're, we're setting up the idea that it's all about the election and you could say in practice, so de jure, I'm sorry, de facto, actually how it's happening. And then they're saying, we're making this theory to say that this really is how democracy works. So also uh, de jure. So yeah, we must not ignore political realities. Donald notes that the lower socioeconomic status groups, the majority are triply barred from such equality by their relatively greater inactivity, their limited access to resources, and in the United States by Madison's nicely contrived system of constitutional checks. Okay, so the idea you can think of what everyone talks about here, electoral college, these types of things, the idea of senators um, in smaller states having just as much power as senators in a larger state as far as representing the amount of people. Um, one of the things that the author, uh, uh, Bateman, is, uh, uh, wants to bring forth is, or highlight is training. So how do you get people to understand any type of what I would call ideology system of um, understanding and practice. I always find it interesting <clears throat> when and how people attack that problem. So on one side, you could say, how do you propagandize people? Uh, there's that 
kind of language is it so used as so much here? It's more, what's the value of social training? Uh, so that's the language. And um, they're putting, they're, they're going through and highlighting for every one of these authors what value uh, training is put in a democracy. And so it's kind of, you can think of it as institutionalization or something like that. So here, social training takes place through the family, schools, churches, newspapers. This is doll distinguishes three kinds of training, reinforcing neutral and negative. He argues that it's reasonable to su suppose that these three kinds of training operate on members of most, if not all, polyarchal organizations and perhaps on members of many hierarchical organizations as well. Dahl put forward an argument about the possible dangers inherent in an increase in participation on the part of the ordinary man. Again, talking about, hey, we don't want regular people participating. And this is pretty, if I remember correctly, this is pretty scathing. The lower socioeconomic groups are the least politically active. And it is also among this group that the authoritarian that the authoritarian personalities are most frequently found. Thus, to the extent that a rise in political activity brought this group in, into the political arena, the consensus on norms might decline and hence the polyarchy decline. So that's the threat. Therefore, an increase over the existing amount of participation could be dangerous to the stability of the democratic system. Again, stability, what is, what's, what's at risk? If you have a resilient democratic system, it resists, let's say, authoritarianism or total, devolving into totalitarianism. If it's not stable or resilient, it's going to devolve into that. Well, what uh, makes the system resilient or stable? Counterintuitively, for Dahl and some of these other authors, less participation in the common, the masses, and definitely the lower socioeconomic groups. Now, this sounds kind of grim, and it gets, we have other authors later that are going to say, hey, no, not so fast. So here we've got Satori, and I want to say they seem like one of the more extremes. Satori stresses that in a democracy, it is not just the minorities that rule, but competing elites. So you have, it's interesting in the democratic theory, when someone talks about minorities, they're talking about the, the like what you call now, like the 1%, that kind of thing. Uh, people with lots of power, but there's only a few of them. And so Satori is kind of concentrating on the competing elite. So like the super, like what we were saying, the less than 1%, really the 0.001. The people he says must react. So one of the things is kind of coming up with an idea of what the regular masses do, what is within their power, within a properly functioning democracy. And um, Sartori is saying the people, all they can do is react. They don't act. They react to the initiatives and policies of the competing elites. So that if you've ever heard people throw around the word reactionary, it's interesting to put it in the context of Sartori. We can only really understand and take an active interest in matters of which we have personal experience or ideas that we can formulate for ourselves, neither of which is possible for the average person where politics is concerned. Again, a bunch of these authors are talking about they struggle with or put forward different theories of why the masses, you could say, or you could call the majority, why they don't participate. It's a given that they don't participate and that they don't want to, and this is contemporary theory, and that they won't in contemporary theory. So 
why is why why will they not do it? Here's one uh, ex, uh, reason: is that they don't have personal experience in those decisions that are these political things, these political decisions that maybe it's foreign policy. So if you don't have pers uh, personal experiences in, in it, then you're not going to care about it. You don't have an actor, active interest in it, and that's why they don't participate. Um, and so they're not going to participate. They're going to say, okay, but whose idea sounds the best? Let's vote for them, that kind of thing. And he says kind of more of an extreme, or maybe not, uh, Satori saying the only way in which we could attempt to change them, so getting the masses to participate, would be to either coerce the apathetic or to penalize the active minority, minority being like, again, elites, neither of which method is acceptable. So he's making a moral, um, a prescriptive claim there. Sartori concludes that the apathy of the majority is nobody's fault in particular, and it is time we stop seeking scapegoats, right? All right, so then we have X theme. Uh, they concentrate on the conditions or prerequisites necessary for a democratic system to maintain stability over time. Again, stability is a common theme that runs through all of these authors, and we're, and we're building up an idea of what democratic theory, what it is to be a democracy means now. Right. All right, so the stability of system uh, refers, to, again, this is X theme or X, yeah, X theme. The stability of the system refers not just to longevity that could result by accident, but survival because of capacity for adjustment to change, realization of political aspirations and the keeping of allegiances. Uh, all right, so it stands to reason that if any aspect of social life can directly affect the government, it is the experiences with authority that men have in other spheres of life, especially those that mold the personalities to those that which they normally devote most of their lives. So uh, Eckstein and some of these other authors, but Eckstein starts talking about what it is that affects that masses, the majority, their relationship with these elites in the democracy. So there's things that are authoritarian, authoritarian uh, authoritative, and there are things that are more, um, uh, you could say, democratized. You're involved more, again, trying not to say you participate more, but you vote more within it. Uh, and then so trying to, it's almost like the Epstein's view is a modern democracy that's stable somehow, again, bringing in the idea of the education or the training of the masses, how do you get the masses to participate or let's say vote without having like a pushback? And then there are this, uh, uh, this um, authoritarian aspects of life. How do you reconcile all of that? And um, Eckstein's view is that that is kind of a, an important part of how you reconcile your idea of what democracy is. So a government will tend to be stable if its authority pattern is congruent Right, with the other authority patterns of society of which it is a part. Right, Certain authority structures simply cannot be democratized. For instance, those in which socialization of the young occurs, so like family and school, right? So those are authoritarian, they're not democracy. You don't have kids like voting in school and how the, what the curriculum is gonna be. And that's an authority authority structure. So you have this idea of different groups that people are part of, and then they learn, this is one of these core concepts 
again, with training and the value of participation is going to, is uh, one of the arguments is you learn through participation. That's one of the values of participation. So you can learn authority and you can learn democracy. Eckstein is saying, oh, of course, in real world democracy, you need to learn both. You need to learn authority because when you do your uh, democracy, you're going to be kind of in an authoritarian. So you have elites, you're, like, you're voting on elites. You need to get used to being in a republic, let's say, a re representative democracy, which is in a, some weird way, authoritarian after you've already voted, right? So uh, here we go. So similarly in economic organizations, democracy might be limit, okay, imitated or simulated, but even this taken too far would lead to consequences no one wants. Um, so there's certain spheres that are undemocratic and Eckstein is saying that that's important. Um, so there's a strain between the authoritarian spheres and the democratic spheres. So the strain can be minimized if there are sufficient opportunities for individuals to learn democratic patterns of action, particularly if the democratic authority structure, so that sounds like a contradiction, right? Democratic authority, right? Democratic authority structures are those closest to government or those that involve political elites. For a stable democracy, the government authority pattern must be made congruent with the prevailing forms of authority structures in society. That is, the governmental pattern must not be purely democratic. Okay, so let's say that again. The de governmental pattern must not be purely democratic. It must contain a balance of disparate elements, and there must be a healthy element of authoritarianism. Right? So this is a democratic um, theorist talking about authoritarianism is necessary. You know, also saying effective decision making, uh, decision -making can only be, uh, take place if this element of authoritarianism is present. The conclusion of Ecclestein's theory is for a democratic system, the structure of authority in a national uh, government necessarily cannot be really or at least purely a democratic one. So now you have X theme, right? And then now we're gonna get into the contemporary theory of dem uh, democracy based off of all of them, okay? All right, so now contemporary, sort of modern view of democracy, and then we're gonna later get into classical. Uh, a characteristically, Demo, uh, democratic element in the method of competition. So this is the definition of democracy, of modern uh, competition of um, elites for the votes of people at a period at a periodic uh, free election. So that's one component. Responsiveness of leaders to non-elite demands or control over leaders is ensured prim primarily through sanction of loss of office at elections. And then we have uh, participation so far as the majority is concerned is participation in the choice of decision makers. Therefore the function of uh, participation in the theory is solely a protective one. The protection of the individual form of arbitrary decisions by elected leaders and the protection of his private interests it is in the achievement of the same that the justification of the of democratic method lies. Again, uh, participation is minimized. It's to the point of your participation in voting for contemporary theory, it's participating in voting. All right. So we have certain conditions. Again, this is drawn from the four authors that we or political theorists that we just surveyed, the level of participation by the majority should not rise above, above the minimum 
necessary to keep the democratic method, the electoral machinery working. That is, it should remain at about the level that exists at present in the Anglo-American democracies. Um, okay, so here's a, I want to, how you pronounce this name, I think it's Beth Roth has noted such a model of democracy can be seen as one where the majority, the non-elites gain maximum output policies, policy decisions from leaders with the minimum input participation on their part. So maximum uh, output with the minimum participation is the theory here. And then we get into the critics. So the critics, argue that the advocates of the contemporary theory have misunderstood classical theory, okay? Um, they're saying that the maximum participation by all the people was central to classical theory. More generally, as Davis is one of the critics of contemporary theory puts it, it was the ideal of rational and active and informed democratic man. That was an ideal of the classical theory and the contemporary theorists are glossing over that. Now the author of Pateman is saying what neither the critics of contemporary theory nor its defenders of contemporary theory have realized is the notion of a classical theory of democracy is the myth. It's, they're saying, famous saying, the nature of the theories of earlier writers on democracy are persistent, persistent, persistently misrepresented. And that is the arguments, I'm sorry, the author's argument um, or premise or set of arguments that why it seems that the contemporary theory is probably holds more weight or is more coherent than what it should be. So uh, we're gonna get into the classical theorists. So this is the end of this chapter and we have another chapter. We've got maybe another 15 minutes and we can try to get through the first part of the other chapter. But we're gonna talk about Jeremy Bentham. So again, a lot of these authors for us, we've, reviewed some of them, we've talked about some of them. Um, as far as fairness, and some of these uh, authors are really influential on obvious, I could say obviously on American, like the Constitution itself or um, American, like democracy in our view of what ideals are and all the stuff like that. Um, so, so it's important to kind of go in this part of the book, very important to go into, so you can kind of see what people that were reasoning about fairness, what they really had to say. Uh, so I find it to be illuminating. So <clears throat> we've got Schumpeter again, refers to the classical theory as an 18th century theory. Okay, so that might be surprising. You might say, wait, democracy is kind of, like Greek, not 18th century, but he's saying it's kind of like a contemporary classic, you could say. So Schumpeter refers to the classical theory as an 18th century theory and says that it developed from small, a small scale prototype. He calls it utilitarian. So we, you, may be, you may remember that Jeremy Bentham is the, kind of father of utilitarianism. He calls it utilitarian. And so taking these remarks as guide, we'll arrive at the names of Rousseau. You might, we have talked about Jacques Rousseau before um, as a uh, philosopher and the two Mills. So that's gonna be James Mill. We haven't really talked about him that much. John Stuart Mill, we have talked about him before. And Bentham, all of whom have a good claim to the tide of classical theorists of democracy. So we have James Mill, John Stuart Mill, and Rousseau, and Jeremy Bentham as classical theorists of democracy. Okay. 
Um, so Bentham, to say, for, as far as democracy, on most, is most issues, the electorate have an opinion as to which policies are in uh, there in the universal interest. And hence an opinion on which policies their delegate should vote for, for Bentham and Mill, I want to say that's James Mill, the people meant the numerous classes. The only body capable of acting as the check against the pursuit of the sinister in, uh, interest by the government. Bentham argued that because the citizen's interest is in security against the bad government, so he will act accordingly and for the gratification of any sinister desire at the expense of the universal interest. So here, the author is saying that Bentham is actually putting up some type of argument that the majority actually does a little bit more than voting. They're going to be interested in what the elites do. So this is a critique of the idea of what Schumpeter, what Schumpeter being the influencer of all those other four uh, authors and political theorists that we said before, as far as contemporary theory, this is a critique of that, saying that Schumpeter's concept of classical is not great. The fact that Bentham and Mill expected each citizen to be interested in politics because it was in his or her best interest to be so and thought that he could be educated to see this is not incompatible with some kind of influence being brought to bear, nor does it imply that each citizen makes a discrete decision on each item of policy, right? So it's not saying that there, how much involvement, you know, like it's super participatory, but there, but it's something more than what um, Schumpeter is saying. Until the theory of participatory democracy has been examined in detail and the possibilities for its empirical realization is assessed, we do not know how much unfinished business or what sort of remain or of what sort remains for democratic theory. That's the end of this chapter. And uh, we can jump into the beginning of the next one for about five minutes or so, or 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll get dig a little bit more into the critique. So any this this chapter was uh, pretty um, involved and dense, like uh, Taylor was saying earlier. Any questions so far? Or comments? And I get into Jacques Rousseau. So Jacques Rousseau is uh, a very influential philosopher for all manner of all manner of things as far as within ethics. Um, his idea on what the social contract is, um, which is social social contract, Thomas Hobbes saying there's, I mean, we, we have talked a little bit about this, but Thomas Hobbes put forward the idea of why governments even exist within his writing, The Leviathan, saying that uh, humans are man, uh, the state of nature of man is a, uh, all of what's called all against all. Uh, everyone's fighting against everyone and government is in there, the uh, forms in order to uh, naturally or organically forms in order to reduce the amount of like, to reduce war let's say you know, um, against one person against another that is and the social contract is what people enter into implicitly to say yeah I'm going to uh, really give up my right to fight my neighbor for when I think they steal something from me to this other authority which is really a higher authority is the government and then they're going to handle it for me it's going to be more efficient and all stuff like that so you can use it for and then that goes into all different types of theorists after that or philosophers that will say okay this is the reason why kings exist the divine right of kings and all this other stuff or it goes into here's why government exists and all this stuff right but that's the essential kind of fundamental western argument for 
hierarchies and government and so on and so forth. Rousseau came back with a pushback against the fundamental tenet of Hobbes saying that that state of nature that everyone was uh, the fundamental the state of nature that everyone's all against all fighting each other he came back um he had a concept of what he called the noble savage he was saying there are um tribes and cultures where there wasn't a government it was very much i would say you could call it an anarchy or you can call it uh just like very organic and uh they 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 didn't need a government and there wasn't a state of war it was, but it's very kind of atomized smaller um so the state of nature that so that uh let's say hobbes came forward with is not really true so that was one critique another one well he has a bunch so that's the this author here so he, and he this uh, the Pateman is kind of saying maybe people weren't including Rousseau as a classical theorist on democracy, but they should. Just a lot of the the views of Rousseau apply to governments in general and what your political theory would be of a government, and it could be the basis of what's going to end up being participation in any government one of them being democratic. So Rousseau might be called the theorist par excellence of participation and an understanding of the nature of the political system that he describes in the social contract is vital for the theory of participatory democracy. So his entire political theory hinges on the individual's participation, uh, on the individual participation of each citizen in political decision-making and his theory um, participation is very much more than a protective uh, adjunct to a set of institutional arrangements, right? Okay, so Rousseau argued that certain economic conditions were necessary for a participatory system. As well known, Rousseau advocated a society made up of small peasant proprietors. Ideally, there, uh, there should be a situation where no citizen shall be rich enough to buy another and none so poor as to be forced to sell himself. And the vital requirement is for each man to own some property, really, essentially, so no one can manipulate. Uh, there's another thing. Men are to be ruled by the logic of the operation of the political situation that they had themselves created, and that this situation was such the possibility of the rule of the individual, individual man was automatically uh, precluded. And then we're going to talk about organized groups here a bit. So how we are on time. We've got about five minutes. Rousseau thought that the ideal situation for decision making was one where no organized groups were present, just individuals, because the former might be able to make their particular wills prevail. He recognized that there would be inevitably be a tacit, there would be tacit associations, organized individuals that were united by some common interest. But it would be very difficult for such tacit association to obtain support for a policy to its special advantage because the conditions under which participation takes place. This right here, you kind of think of lobbyist groups and all that, and it's like, uh oh, I don't know about that or so. So, but he comes back and says, if if it was impossible to avoid associate uh, uh, organized associations within the community, then Rousseau argues these should be as numerous as equal in political power as possible. Uh, I'm sorry, as numerous and as equal in political power as possible. So if you can't get rid of all the associations or these groups, then have many of them, and then that will equalize the power. So his ideal system is designed to develop responsible individual, social, and political action through the effect of the participatory process, right? So again, Rousseau is going to be, like what the author said, par excellence participatory influencer type person. He's going to be the one that you're going to go to for getting the arguments for participation. And I'm going to go through this section and then that'll be it. So his idea, Rousseau's notion on freedom, kind of paradoxical 
and important to the arguments of kind of important for developing a framework for reasoning about participation, I should say. So he said, a, this is a paradoxical statement, a man might be forced to be free. So forcing someone to be free. A man might be forced to be free. And he also defined freedom as obedience to a law one prescribes to oneself. Obedience to a law one prescribes to oneself. Absolutely sounds like Immanuel Kant. This is Immanuel Kant's idea of what where ethics come from. So I can kind of see a bunch of influence uh, of where you can kind of see where um, the ideas, the theory is going with Rousseau as far as how laws are developed and so on and so forth in order to create a different framework other than Hobbes Leviathan, let's say. Rousseau also argues that freedom requires that he should exercise a fair measure of control over those that execute the laws and over representatives if an indirect system is necessary, right? So the, this is talking about the regular person, the majority. They should exercise a fair amount of measure of control over who executes the laws and over their representatives. Right, so this is beyond voting is what the, the, um, the author is saying. It is the whole point of Rousseau's argument that the existing non-participatory institutions do pose such a threat. Indeed, they make freedom impossible. Men are everywhere in chains. The ideal institu institutions described in the social contract are ideal because Rousseau regards their operation as guaranteeing freedom. So these are the ideal institutions, really what should be created. This is gonna be what, um, what, the, uh, what the ideals are instead of, the, again, a critique is ideal versus in practice. Schumpeter is like, hey, let's talk about what's in practice and those other four. We need to include what's in practice. And they kind of, he even went so far as critiquing classical as saying they didn't have ideals. And Rousseau is saying, oh no, there are ideals when you're gonna deal with any government, so on and so forth. Can so, you read the, um, mm -hmm. that sub bullet uh, re related to the freedom? It's, it's under the force. Cause I think that, that like Which what one? you just read is related to the um, being forced to be free, and then that sub part where he's arguing. Yes, unless no, yes, what, right there, yeah. Yes, so sir. that yeah, that seems related to the other part as far as like you're not having freedom and you're actually in chains. Yeah, and it's going into why that's the case. Okay, so Rousseau argues that unless each individual is forced through the participatory process into socially responsible action, then there can be no law which in, ensures everyone's freedom. In other words, there can be no general will or a kind of just law that the individual can prescribe to themselves. That's if they don't participate. Uh, so um, this Rousseau is a big, and I'm gonna stop here since eight or five. Rousseau is the big participatory person. We'll come back to this and we'll try to get through. This is kind of the beginning of this book is gonna be more dense because they're gonna to try to get you to have a good, a strong idea of the framework of what democracy is, all that. And it's kind of, I wanna say, it kind of tries to rip away your idea of what you think democracy is as far as theoretical, because um, people, the normal person just thinks it's, it's voting. And then that's, that's the best we can do, or that's all that we can do, or that's what we should do, and that's it. And the first four, you have the example there. You could try to argue with the, with the author and say, you know what? 
I don't think those those the um the theorists that they that they uh, surveyed are representative of what democracy really is and all this stuff. I, is that really right? But I think that from going back also and to our other book, the um, Inverted Totalitarianism, uh, Sheldon Wollin, he was highlighting some of the same authors that are in this book and further on in this chapter and on further on, um, saying the same things. Uh, so it essentially, the system of democracy actually wants the least amount of participation and is about trying to move control into the elites. And that's kind of, you can look at it as what I would call de facto democracy, how it really works. And you can rationalize, you can't get people to participate more, you can get them to participate more, you can rationalize the ethics of it or not the ethics of whatever. Sheldon Wallen is all about, this is how you exploit this stuff and this is how it's exploited. This one uh, book here starts talking about, okay, we're gonna deal with the ideals of democracy, we're getting into it here. And then how it could be, hey, we can actually more participation could work. Um, you know, and then here's some authors, uh, and philosophers yeah. and theorists. So can yeah. Ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Um, okay, let me see. So is Rousseau saying that representative democracy intends uh, fundamentally to transfer the power from the the population to the elites or does he talk about or is he talking about direct democracy so like what you're saying direct direct democracy he's going to be more on that side russo is going to be by mm -hmm. i'll just get more personal with taylor when i met taylor what's it like 11 years ago now and uh, we talked for some months or whatever, and I was like, you know what, your philosopher is Jacques Rousseau. That way mm -hmm. back now, it's like, this is the guy for you. Um, he is definitely going to be getting most people, like with this right here, mm -hmm. this right here. Rousseau might be called the theorist par excellence mm -hmm. of participation. Participation of the majority. <laughs> That's against them. The elites don't want the majority Right. The elites, again, the minority, don't want the majority to participate. They want them to stay apathetic. Did, yes. um, were you here earlier Sometimes when he easy. was going through the other the other um, theorists that, that mm -hmm. they were talking about their views on democracy? I only caught Eric Stein. Eric Stein okay. I, I caught Betham and Mill. The two. All right. Yeah. So okay. that I... I I mean, I, I don't know why it's written like this. It bothers me. I'm sure there's like a reason to present it this way, but in the, the book and as far as like how it goes through and talking about modern um, theorists and, and philosophers talking about democracy, those are the ones that are, in my mind, taking things out of context versus, and they're pointing, and this is something Watson talked about earlier, they're leaning into the theories from a lot of different um, people, including Rousseau, but then they take it out of context. Uh, there's some stuff that I've I've seen, and I don't know if, if you're going to get into it, Watson, but where it's it's saying that Rousseau was focused on a time where it looked like people need to be almost poor as a whole, and I think that was more of where he was and so there could be you could say well we can actually everyone can just be richer or whatever would be one view but the overall would be Rousseau was saying we need to get everyone should have um should should be able to have a equitable everyone should have equal uh, voting or community participating in the whole process and the system itself needs to ensure that they can be a part of that. And then the other theorists that are like talking about modern democracy and stuff, 
that were pointed out here. I mean, they're not all like this, but a lot of what's being put forward right now, it's it's trying to limit and say, no, if we get too many people, it's going to cause problems. And uh, whether or not they're actually doing that because they believe it or not, it ends up being what you were saying. It ends up pushing the power into that smaller elite group mm. because they have they're going to have the voice and everything else. And I don't think we've, we just kind of barely touched on it, but there's stuff with Rousseau on um, participation and, and like education and other stuff. Uh, there was a part that was talking about democratic education and that's a problem. I don't, I don't want to dig, dig into that, but okay. the, the <laughs> idea of education itself and the fact that I, I think that that does affect the groups that um, the people are saying you can't get people in the um, in some of these populists joining in and participating because they're going to have totalitarian views, but they're having those views, and this is my thoughts on it, because of their education and how they've been brought into this. So the structure of the whole system mm. is bringing them to be, I don't even know if I'd call it less democratic, because you could say someone could vote for a dictator, and then that means that they're, they are thinking democratically or whatever. But I, th I think that in my mind, that shallow view, a shallow viewpoint, and a lot of these people that are taking Rousseau out of context, they're doing that on purpose versus yeah, what could, Rousseau would say is you need that structure. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I I imagine that they would take him out of context, uh, but I would not say that they're doing it because they believe what they're saying. I, I, I tend to think that uh, generally smart people understand certain concepts very well but they choose to lie to lie about it because the, the the incentives are are structured so they have to lie uh, i'm i'm thinking about like an intellectual for example a professor in in the university if the university is very much tied to businessmen that are donating <laughs> that are donating to the university so you you could expect those intellectuals those professors per se to to lie about it and not only be wrong. Uh, okay, but my question really is: um, uh, it seems like a lot of people confuse confuse uh, a republic, a representative republic, all right, with with democracy, and it's not clear if it's not clear if we're talking about direct democracy where where it happened in Athens, where they where people had to, I mean, ancient Athens, of course, people had to vote in every issue. If, should they go to war? Should they invest them, uh, certain funds to a certain school or a certain bridge or whatever? Or are we talking about a representative democracy where we have a Congress system? Yeah, this book starts out with what the, uh, the survey of these four authors um, original in the first chapter, it starts out with what they're saying, what they're calling classic democracy, they're already said, oh, yeah, the, the Athens. No, that doesn't work. Too oh. It's too slow. Yeah, they just okay. start out that way. They start out with saying, hey, um, the classical view, again, the authors were that were influential for what they're calling classical view. So we have Schumpeter, who's contemporary. And then the classical view was going to be Jeremy Bentham, the two mills. So mm -hmm. James Mill, John Stuart Mill um no. yeah so uh, i forget okay. who uh, what the other one was but um but yeah they're going to say democracy yeah it's going to be representative and mm. they <clears throat> it's funny because those two those mills that the author here Peyton, is saying that that even those Sorry. classical what they call the 18th century classical democratic theory so yeah. heavily influential on in the United States, constitute all that. Even they were more about participation, what you're saying, direct democracy. So thinking of the individual citizen saying, hey, are we going to go to war? Let's vote directly on a war, uh, you know, um, statute or something. 
Mm -hmm. they they are saying that the classical ones actually did this is 18th century classical they actually did have they were more open to or um were more for participation in that sense right mm. so but one of the things that's left out so you have direct direct democracy you have representative democracy that what this book is about participation a okay. big part the first chapter develops and then the second chapter develops what it called uh, uh taylor brought out and not to be confused you have democratic education not oh the student is voting to say here's what's on the curriculum no De educating people in how democracy works so what is that that's the book is a big uh, tenet of that is how you get someone to learn how to function in a democracy so you could go back to an athens and actually make a direct or democracy work or someone having someone vote on uh things more intelligently is to have them participate in democracy that's how you educate them so the author's preoccupied with talking about educating them well how do you educate them yeah. participating in democracies what democracies all of these little other institutions mm -hmm. smaller associations and all that and that we're gonna we're getting ahead of ourselves but that includes um the industrial side the economic side corporations so cooperatives mm. Okay. That's that's where it goes. So the educational system that will prepare us to one day live in a direct democracy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The okay. um they call it a participatory democracy because well, now we're getting into something wild, but I bet you like if you take these authors, Dahl, Satori, Eckstein, and Burleson, Schumpeter, you take them and take the equivalent of them now. Mm -hmm. You, I bet, if you were to just go for direct democracy and say, we're going to implement this, the equivalent of those people who are there right now, they will find a way to make direct democracy screwed up. Uh, are you talking about the elites? Yeah. They would? They're, these are theorists. But they basically, and you're like how you say these theorists, like what you were saying before, as far as how they behave, the incentive system, and all that stuff. These the democratic uh, theorists, they're going to find a way to make direct democracy. If you don't have the education and the participation mm -hmm. side, they'll make that part like you will vote for something that's against your own interests. Yeah, it's right now. It's like you vote against the leader that's against your own interests. Which, if you were to go back 400 years ago or something like that, people would think. No, why would someone do that? That's silly. And now you have it. Okay, now we move to the next level. Individual um, items like let's go to war. Like you'll have people say, yeah, why not? You, you, it's not, you wouldn't even believe that that would be possible. But I think there probably would be new methods for doing that. I would say if you don't have participation in democracy, if people vote and then walk away, because they're apathetic, you probably can still have that, I would say. with the, That's why I think that phrase is not used here mm. so much. Very it's, interesting. Yeah, I yeah. know what you're saying. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's not very hard to, to program the masses, really. Especially yeah. if we have a participatory, right now, if we had a participatory democracy, it would be through technology. Meaning yeah. you could imagine a system where people uh, vote in, in an app, yeah. Uh, so whatever whatever kind of advertising will be on that app will will convince us to vote either way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that could be how it would be exploited. So you'll mm -hmm. see in these books like this one, if you go back to um, we have we uploaded a, some um, sorry, Sheldon Walden, the inverted totalitarianism book The <clears throat> the idea of voting. And it happening at a on a cycle, so every four years, every whatever, that can be exploited. And it's not this author is not. They're saying voting. That's not participation. Like straight up. Yeah. There's right. more to it, and part of it is being involved with. There's different solutions, but part of it is in being involved in an easy low hanging fruit. One could be 
where you work. So you're involved, you have the managerial class and you have the regular. That is the fight. So how does the, the how do the masses deal with the managerial? And as, if they're participating in it, it starts to be the managerial starts to be smaller and smaller, or mm -hmm. if it stays there, this, the, 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 the dynamics are going to be less voting, like it's not a, a um, popularity contest where you vote the manager, it's going to be, oh, I know how to direct the business, oh, no, I understand that we need to spend this much money on marketing, this much money on this, whatever. Take that to the and you let's say you're let's say you grew up with that from the time you were 14 or 16 when you first started working. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So when I do um I go into as far as um on the grander scale, government or whatever, oh war. Oh well, my uncle went to war. I didn't like that. He came back with a missing arm. I don't know, whatever, right? You start to be more involved that kind of thing instead of saying oh they know what they're doing over there they need to go ahead and bomb this country that has yeah, oil yeah it's <laughs> like a real a real event example or a real life example yeah you have a real life example if you had a, a father or an uncle that was a ceo of a certain company you you're more you tend to have certain thoughts in your head that most people won't have um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, I don't know how much you're involved with, but as far as cooperatives, it's everybody who's part of the 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 entity. Mm -hmm. They are also a director, right? They and you could set up the entity all different ways, but you're involved with where what we call the surplus, where the money goes. So you make a widget. Let's say the widget takes six dollars to uh to make you sell it for ten dollars that four dollars that's a surplus where does that go right now in your regular job you don't have no say where yeah. the four dollars go when you made a widget you help make a widget within a cooperative or a, a, a employee managed own that kind of thing mm -hmm. you do you have to say where it goes and you could say you know what let's spend it on garbage and you go out of business because you don't you can't compete because you needed to reinvest whatever but you learn oh last time we spent it on garbage we it didn't work out and last year we had a bad year or we went out of business now i'm with it that that's democratic so you're voting and figuring out you're but you're involved with the the repercussions mm -hmm. right when it's too far away you're not involved that's less participation so a big part of the bring it back to the book, a big part of the argument is how do people get educated on democracy? How do they and it, they're saying this participation is the best. So right. and that would and that education will really include in a high level would include the political side, uh, political, social slash social side and the economical side would would uh, which would have as a sub part sub element running businesses running corporations yeah yeah there's a whole theory in this chapter that we're not getting to we we'll get to it next month but there's a whole theory of how it comes the argument could be it, the best way to have more participation would be from mm -hmm. the economic side yes um, okay. because yeah. businesses tend to control uh, politicians yeah like well okay. that's yeah there's there's definitely <laughs> disproportionate are uh power there but like it's what the argument is that it, we're closer to that because that's your day to day. A, a critique we have Richard Wolf. Uh, we, we've reviewed yes. a couple of his books. Yeah, uh, where he, he crit, yeah he critiques is like oh yeah you live in a democracy well eight hours of the day you're an authoritarian you're a totalitarian structure yeah. you're not a democracy so that yeah. whole thing they're saying no flip that you're gonna be get learning those eight hours of the day is how it should be. That kind of thing. So the book saying that all of these other institutions, all of these other associations that you're involved with in the day to day, make them as democratic as possible. Then you can defeat the arguments of the contemporary theorists. Contemporary theorists say regular people, the vast majority, I'm just going to say the majority, mm -hmm. they are apathetic. They don't want to participate on their own. Right. And then and so you can't do it. Their whole thing is more pragmatic argument. You can't, you can't get people to be what you think is a democracy other than voting. 
So here's your vote. No, um, you have the Rousseau's and then we're going to get other people. They're saying, no, here's a way we could do it. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I still have like two questions, but I'll, I'll ask you on if we have time. Mm. Or we're about to go. Whoever like, else. Ask yeah. Ask them if anybody, unless someone else. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I dropped an example related yeah, to the saw that. causing confusion. It's in the chat. Like a recent real example where people have the ability to vote, but you can have people intentionally trying to confuse things. Oh, I know you're yeah. talking about in Austin. Yeah, in Austin. Yeah, yeah it's recent. It was, it was intentional. The language was the same between things. And the only way that you can deal with stuff like that is to have, um, you know, more participation. Ed, yeah, more yeah. well, edu the education, participation, so that people are actually learning and understanding and seeking to understand. It's just part of their daily life. Yeah, because th this sort of thing is what ends up causing people to go. Well, it doesn't matter. It's going to be confusing, and then and then the these folks that we're talking about we go yep see they don't want to do anything all right so what was all the two questions oh uh, well uh, thank you for that by the way i've read it too uh, taylor thank you i'm reading it and i see what you're saying um well um first question is is there any thought put into how the elites the benevolent elites if that, if that exists right but it probably does there are some billionaires that are kind of good people and um is there any thought about how they're actually scared maybe they do agree with us with the cooperatives but they're scared of giving up their power because because it could could we could we could down the road 20 years from here end up in a situation where the majority of the population actually wants to harm in some way the ancient elites right that, that's that's the first question. <laughs> yeah. Um, this author, I don't know so far. I don't think so. Um, there, as far as there's, you said any thought. So there's definitely yeah. a structure for trying to reel in people who are going against the, the views, right? Mm. Um, there's also thought and outside of what I've seen in this author so far, but we'll we'll go through next month. We'll get through the rest of the book or what have you. Um, I can recommend one author, Vivek. So with a V, not a Z, not Zizek, but Vivek, V I V E K. Vivek. Um, Vivek Chibur, Chibur. The um, the Class Matrix, I think, is a book. But his, but you can just look up his videos online. Okay. Um, definitely, you know, sociologist, but just talks about the subject that you just brought up. How is it that um, someone that is good natured, how mm -hmm. do they, and let's say they have more resources. Yeah. What is their life like? How, when they go in to try, they try to do something different than what the elites want. What is the system like that reels them back in? And it, it, I think he's good because it's not like conspiracy theory and all that stuff like that. He just talks about all of the different systems that reel people back in, which is could be managerial class, which is in the middle. There's the people who are, you could say, owners, capital, mm -hmm. or what have you on the top. And it gives you a good structure for reasoning about the motivations so you have the motivations you can go against what against your own interests and that part i think is hard to reason about so you if you were to say what you said mm -hmm. a billion a billionaire or in elite or somebody like that that wants to go you would have this i say uh vivek gives you a structure where you can say okay they're going against their own interests. It's kind of irrational for them to do that. They can do it. It's irrational. That's a whole kind of person. What do they meet up with? He kind of has a whole structure of reasoning about that. So it would be, I imagine there would be like some social pressures. 
like Lots. his friends, his investors, and so on. Even family, I would imagine. If he's a Everyone. guy, his wife or his, yeah. his husband. All right, I can't imagine. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. the, the second question would be, um, uh, would you guys say that you would only support a, a presidential candidate that that is that advocates for co cooperations, co cooperatives? Cooperatives. Yeah. <laughs> uh the, you mean like only you know you're getting into like i would say voting theory so are you gonna are you gonna vote for this person that is gonna be for your view but then within a system that we have right now you could take away from the lesser of two evils mm -hmm. if you're starting to talk about like that so yeah. i don't i don't really for me i mm -hmm. don't know i don't even really know what to do there as far as yeah uh, so is is uh is free market a toxic word or is not uh, to you guys um free market is it a toxic word or, or, so or a term yeah yeah term mm -hmm. um i would say that within the context of you know you make and there's so many books that we reviewed that it kind of pours more gives you a good a better context of idea of free markets so when you go into guilds and talk about the mid medieval guilds we uploaded two reviews of that um those books um you can see like do you call medieval guilds and what they were doing would you call that a free market and, and, right so they would be you had a city you had a lot of the cities you could talk about um florence um a bunch of other cities where they really wasn't like people have the misconception that there was a king and they told people what to do. No, they were actually free. And it was really guilds doing things and running things and people bought stuff, but the guilds had a bunch of rules. And well, what were the repercussions for not following those rules? Well, then you couldn't work at the guild or they might not sell to you. Like you had all of that, that type of pushback and mm -hmm. guilds might even use violence. So is it a free market? The um, it's so saying what it is that is a free market, trading things and being able to trade things and stuff like that i'm definitely for that um you, i would say if you were to form your if you were to form your question like this do you believe in top down control of prices then i would say for me no no um right, right. so and then that's where some of the arguments against guilds in as much as it became the most powerful guilds, the strongest ones. So it ended up being there were banking guilds and things like that, where they started saying, oh, they had disproportionate power. They started saying, we're going to control something that we have nothing to do with, like the what they call the haberdasheries or whatever, like, oh, you're selling, you know, uh, purses and wallets and stuff. This is the price. Like that seems wrong. Um, and so that that part that's where it would be oh that's not a free market all this stuff like that and i'm going to be against it right even with the guilds type thing so free market it's funny capital says they'll critique the the when the guilds started having smaller and bigger and bigger had disproportionate power they started critiquing that and saying hey they're going against free markets they're trying to say a limitation on this type of innovation, this type of pricing, this type of whatever. And so you shouldn't do that. And then of course it turns into, now you have just corporations that, you know, you get to the point that they're monopolistic and then they set the price. So I have yeah. the same problem, but yeah. Okay, I see your point. So the, the guilds, by the way, can you give me a time frame? The uh, guilds would be 1400s to 1800s. In Europe or? Um, Europe and um, yeah, well, this, the books that we reviewed mm -hmm. were going to be the European guilds. So all like France was a big one, England and Italy. Okay. Uh, That's great. Uh, I've been, by the way, just a point here. I've been reading Exit Voice and Loyalty by Albert Hirschman. It's a, it's a great book. Write it down. Uh, let's see here. Exit voice. What does it have to do with it? It, it talks about it talks about the analysis between 
when some corporations prefer you to exit. I mean, it's like leave, stop buying from them. And the same actually happens to co countries also. They prefer the, the people that have a voice that have been, they've been uh, they've been criticizing them. They prefer them to just leave the country. And <laughs> see, like it's very interesting because it, it it shows a lot. It shows a lot of why a lot of African countries actually just send their their smart people to the United States and and Europe because they they don't want an in, an intelligent critique of their doings. Interesting. Oh, um, that was exit voice, and it was Albertson. Who was it? Albert? Michelle. Uh, go ahead. So, excuse me. Go ahead. What was the author again? Oh, Albert Hirschman. Albert Hirschman. Okay. Uh, Noam Chomsky recommended him. Oh, okay. Yeah, in his book, uh, Consequences of Capitalism. Okay. Noam Chomsky. Yeah. Okay.